Jesus said, Woman, great is your faith, and her daughter was healed instantly. meditation in my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I think we must have all got a bit bored of Covid news because I've noticed in recent times the news has started to revert to type, particularly this week uh, we've had weather and exams, uh, which is a, a staple favourite about this time of year, and also refugees. Refugees are a seasonal uh, news story because uh, August and September tend to be the quietest months on the seas, uh, the weather we've had recently notwithstanding, so it tends to be this part of the year uh, that they, the, the idea of refugees apparently flooding in comes, apparently. It's hard to know the facts about whether the numbers of refugees coming to Britain are unmanageable, in fact, it's very hard to say what manageable might be in terms of a number, but it's also hard to know whether those refugees are genuine asylum seekers or whether they're economic migrants. So it's sensible, of course, to treat them with a level of caution. But what level that caution needs to be is very much a matter of judgment. So that's one news story that's been about, uh, and I want to put that alongside two other snippets of news which uh, really got me thinking. The first one was a recent survey said that the majority of Brits blame the public for the continuing spread of the coronavirus uh, rather than the authorities, uh, which is interesting because normally we blame the authorities for absolutely everything, but at the moment we are blaming the public. And add to that just one little tiny uh, bit of a news report that I heard while driving on the radio, uh, which was someone who had a very thick Pakistani accent clearly, to my mind at least, a first-generation immigrant saying, we have to control immigration. I'm not talking about refugees, but immigration in general. So the, there are those three news items, uh, the refugee issue, the fact that we are blaming the public for the spread of coronavirus and the first-generation immigrant calling for a control on immigration. And the question that came to my mind is, in all of those three instances, who are we as opposed to they? Who is the constituency of people in those three news items where we count them as our number, if you like? If we blame the public for the spread of the coronavirus, we almost certainly don't mean us, although we are part of the public. 
if we regard asylum seekers with a, a high level of suspicion, if a first generation immigrant can call on us to control immigration, who is us in that picture? And who is them? Now, for the sake of clarity, I'm not judging these issues. Uh, from an epidemiological perspective, the public are certainly responsible for the spread of the coronavirus, because that's how viruses work, through spreading through people. Uh, there obviously needs to be some level of caution uh, when we're dealing with refugees. The question is what level? Uh, and there certainly needs to be some controls on immigration. Again, the question is what level? It's a matter of degree for all of those things. The question that interests me is how far up and down the scale we have our level of suspicion or control or blame, and how we speak into that theologically. What God tells us about those issues. The question of who is them and who is us is a question addressed in both of our readings today. In the history of Israel, within the pages of the Bible, we see this question, who belongs to us, being played out. In times of wealth and plenty in Israel, the gates were actually pretty wide open. The whole story of Jonah uh, is a story about an entire city of Nineveh, millions of people, uh, according to the, the numbers in the Bible, which are never terribly reliable, uh, becoming Jews because God wanted it, and Jonah running away from being the evangelist because he didn't want it. In Jesus' time, the divisions between who was us and them uh, were pretty delineated. There was a feeling, as often there is in a, in a, in a society when there's anxiety and, and fear and a certain amount of, of feeling of being persecuted, uh, the, the delineation between us and them was very strong. Of course there were delineations between the Romans and the Jews, uh, but it's worth mentioning that the Romans weren't Italians, and the Romans in Judaism at the time weren't just soldiers and people who worked for the military bases. There is plenty of archaeological evidence to talk about there being Roman citizens who settled in Israel. Jesus as a carpenter would almost certainly have worked on some of the Roman villas being set up by people who were French or German or Egyptian or Syrian, any part of the Roman Empire who came to settle in Israel. These Roman citizens would have used the artisans. They would have bought from the local farmers. They were ordinary, if comparatively wealthy, people. But they were definitely not us to the Jews. There were also a, a, another set of thems to the Jews, the Samaritans, of course, and the Canaanites, such as the woman in our Gospel. The word Canaanite actually doesn't have anything to do with Cain or Abel. It was basically a catch-all term for foreigners. In Mark's Gospel, uh, she's known as the Syrophoenician women, woman, because Mark, of course, is writing for the Roman audience rather than Matthew's Jewish audience. But crucially, in Jesus' time, the Canaanites in the region of Tyre and Sidon, where Jesus was when this happened, lived in a land where the scriptures had said ought to belong to the Jews. So they represented Israel's failure as a state and the unfairness of their current situation. So to Jesus, she was most definitely a them, not an us. At this point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus knows who he is. He is the Messiah of Israel. He is the anointed one of the Jews. He may not know at this stage the implications of what is going to happen to him, but his fight, and it is a fight, is with the Jewish authorities. He's not advocating violence, but he's advocating revolution. And he believes that his gifts of healing, which are hugely prominent in the Gospels, are the gifts that God has given him to achieve this purpose. God has made him, shaped him, to lead the Jewish people into a new episode of their chosen life. Maybe that's why he went to Tyre and Sidon, the land that God had promised to the Jews. And there he meets this woman. Not a, not a beggar woman. She's called a lady, which implies an upstanding citizen. Although this time she wasn't upstanding, she fell at his feet. She humbled herself, humiliated herself to this foreigner, prostrated herself at the feet of a Jew, a cultural anathema. 
She humiliates herself with the hope that this man, this Jewish man of which she has heard so much, might be different, might see past her race and his, might see her need and have compassion. And he doesn't. He's a product of his own upbringing and he doesn't because she is a Canaanite and he is a Jew. Now many people have commented that the woman's reply uh, was very clever in her response. Even the dogs may eat the scraps from the, the children's table. Clever in that she was arguing theologically with Jesus. Clever in that she acknowledged her place as a dog. Clever that she showed him that she thought only a little of his immense power would save her daughter. I just think she was desperate. So desperate that she's prepared to put up with, with whatever insult Jesus wants to throw at her. So desperate that she wasn't put off by being called a dog, which was a huge insult in those days. So desperate that she is willing to, to, to cope with public humiliation. And it would have been public, she lived there, he didn't. In front of her neighbours, she was kneeling at his feet, accepting being called a dog, because Jesus doesn't see who she is. A woman whose daughter is sick. Joseph's brothers never saw his face. Throughout the whole story of his life, his brothers never saw his face. First they saw his coat, and they were jealous, and they hated him. Then they saw his authority in Egypt, his power, and they feared him. But in that first reading, the end of that long story of Joseph, he wept and said again and again in the reading, he literally said, come closer to me, look at me, see me. And that's what I think the Canaanite woman was saying to Jesus. See my face. See me. And he did. And make no mistake about it, this is the point in the Gospels where Christianity becomes a worldwide religion, not just an improved version of Judaism. And it was because she made him look at her and something happened to him which broke him out of his old ways and prejudices. He saw her face. And everything changed. Because there are times, moments when something overtakes you, when all your ideas and the thoughts that run through your head and all your logic and reason take second place. And you look at someone or see something which you need to do, someone which compels you to help, and you stop thinking, oh gosh, this is really difficult. Where do you draw the line? There are so many things to consider. And you start thinking, whatever we do, I have to do this. Because something takes you over. And that is the grace of God. There are moments when we stop being small, insular, frightened people. Like the Jews. And their clear delineations of who was in and who was out. Those are the moments where there is no division between us and them. Because we are greater than we were before. Those are the moments when we become God's children by that chill shudder of compassion that goes through us. When we know that they are God's children too. After this event, Jesus thinks differently. He knows that the kingdom of God is not simply for the house of Israel. He knows that he's made God's love far too small. And he knows that preaching that will get him into trouble. Everyone was his family from this moment on. Everyone was his responsibility. Everyone were his children. He was changed. And the world was changed by a mother desperate for her daughter. That is the Messiah we follow. There are many crises that our world faces at the moment, and there always will be. And there are always judgment calls to make. And God doesn't tell us how to solve any of them. 
what processes to put in place. But he tells us one simple thing, which means that our compassion and his grace are given free reign. He tells us that before we put people into groups, whether we call them refugees or public or immigrants, before we do that, whatever groups of people we want to categorise people as, before we do that, we have to see their faces. We have to see them. Because they are children of God. And we are children of God. Like Joseph's brothers, one day we may be in a position to reject them, and another day we may need help from them. But every day we need to see their faces because they are our family. Amen.